Good worship here, church. Amen. you. It's really, really good. And it makes my job so much easier. Because as we really encounter the presence of the Lord like that, most people are satisfied for the day. So it doesn't really matter what I say. You've already got your church filled. All right. This last week, my daughter celebrated her 11th birthday. Hey, Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. So it's brought all these new conversations in our life. Like, now you know that. Now that I'm 11. <laughs> that means in four years, I'm going to have my learner's purpose. <laughs> and in five years, you'll be buying me a car. Uh -huh. yeah, stuff like that. She's trying to kill me at a young age. <laughs> so for her birthday last weekend, we went over to the town of Sugwine. You know what that place is? Sugwine, right down the road. And over at Sugwine, there's this place called ZDT. So we went to this ZDT place. If you don't know about it, it has all these cool things like, you know, go-karts and arcades and this contraption of death that drops you and then picks you back up, drops you again. And they have this brand new big wooden roller coaster right there on the premises. So we go in and we're getting signed up and getting our tickets. And the little guy that was selling stuff, he had to be like employee of the year. Because he was, you could not have found anybody happier to be working at ZDT than this young guy. Okay, 16 years old. And, we're so glad you're here today. You're going to have the best day of your life. <laughs> well, he was excited about working at ZDT. And he goes, and I want you to know that everything's included. You know, the go-karts and the death dropping thing and the arcades. Everything's included. Except the roller coaster, because it doesn't open till next week. Okay, so you can feel the momentum in, in my family. My wife, my daughter, my son, they love the roller coasters. They think that's fantastic. So they were like, oh man. But this guy doesn't like roller coasters. So I didn't show it on the outside, but on the inside I was going, ooh, thank you, Jesus. Because if it was open, they was going to make me ride it even though I didn't want to. So I'm thinking, Lord, this is, I am overwhelmed by your goodness to me. So then chipper 16-year-old guy says, so it's closed not only until next week, but, that's bad, this is not good for me, but for you fine folks, we're going to have a two-hour sneak preview unannounced. Nobody knows about it. The roller coaster is going to be open for two hours, and it opens in ten minutes. <laughs> so you can see my family. Oh, roller coaster! You can see me. Oh, roller coaster! So we go get in line. We're going to be the second car to ever go through this roller coaster. Hey, I've watched the news. I know people die on roller coasters. Y'all can tell that to Facebook, folks. It's not. I've seen it happen. So if there's going to be a good time to die on a roller coaster, it's probably the second car to ever go. So I'm just saying, Lord, don't let me die. Not today. I want to see you, Lord. Not today, really. I mean, I do, but not today. So we start the death climb, right? Tick, 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 tick. Oh, no, we're almost there. Oh, this is bad. I'm screaming. I don't like it. Whoosh, we go down the thing, you know, we do all this. I got my eyes closed the whole time. Just go, it's almost over. It's almost over. It's like childbirth. We're almost done. <laughs> okay. Finally, I feel it come to a stop. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That is over with. I don't open my eyes. I'm looking at the sky. Oh, this is bad. So the roller coaster at the end, it goes straight up. And then it comes back down and does the whole thing in reverse. Oh. Horrible. Horrible. Terrible. So this is what I thought about after. You know, lots of roller coaster rides, they take a picture. You know, you can see them. So there's five kinds of people that I often see riding roller coasters. You look at that picture and you see number one, 
You see the people that are sick, right? They get off and they are green and they are stumbling. They're going, shouldn't have had the roasted corn. <coughs> They are sick. See that a lot. Number two, you always see the people that are mad. That's usually me, right? I don't want to be on this thing and my kids made me right. <laughs> They're mad. They get off. They didn't like it, but they said they did it. They're just mad. Number three, there's always the ones that get scared. Right? I don't like roller coasters. That scared me to death. I hated it forward. I hated it more backwards. I'm terrified. Then number four, there's always the people that are kind of indifferent. You know, oh, it wasn't bad, it wasn't great, didn't hate it, didn't love it. Didn't get sick, but don't really feel not sick. Whatever. Just roll up. Then there's number five. Number five is the demented individuals. <laughs> like my wife. And, oh, they're thrill seekers, right? And this is their picture. Woo! <laughs> they think it's the greatest thing ever. I want to not hold on. I want to fly through the air 400 miles an hour and hope I don't die. Slide in your best day ever. Now you can see yourself in one of those five places. We've all been there. But when you think about it, regardless of your feelings about roller coasters, which one do you really want to be? Everybody wants to be. <coughs> I wonder about in this train called life or this <coughs> roller coaster journey that we're on. I know a lot of people that live their life and they're sick. There's a lot of people that live their life and they're mad. There's a lot of people that are indifferent. There's a lot of people who are scared. But there's very few people that live life going, ooh, 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 ooh. This is something else. Because they really understand the value of the statement that we only have one life. This is it. This is my one life. So I'm going to make the most of it. So this is where we've been. We started off saying, okay, we're going to build and maintain momentum, so we're going to love God, and we're going to love others. That's our foundation. This is where we start. Then we're going to go back, and we looked at the church, and we saw, you know, when they first got together, they focused on Scripture, the apostles' teaching, they prayed, they fellowshiped, they celebrated. We understood that we have to let go of what's behind us, press on towards what's ahead. We have to have that one thing we're going to try to be like Christ in our life. We saw that we are one body. Lots of parts, all have to function, all have something different to do, but we're all connected through Jesus. And then last week we saw that on this ride, even with the right foundation, even when we are loving God and loving people, when we are following Scripture, when we are encouraging and we are loving each other, we still are going to have obstacles. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's people sitting next to us, sometimes it's the world, sometimes it's the devil. But the obstacles are always going to be there. But we can overcome them through the power of the Spirit. This morning, we want to see how is it on this ride, can we really enjoy it and have no regrets at the end of the journey. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to be in verses 16 through 34. Lots of passages today. Acts 16, 16 through 34. Three things we have to do or know to enjoy the ride. Number one, we have to jump at the chance. Years ago, I heard a story about a famous bank robber named Pepe Rodriguez. So Pepe Rodriguez was high out in Mexico. He jumped across the border. He robbed a few banks. And he jumped back across before the rangers could catch him. Finally, after years and years and years of pursuing Pepe, the rangers got fed up and they just went ahead and crossed over into Mexico. And they pursued him and they trailed him and finally they got him pulled up in a little bar on the edge of the country. They walked in there, 12 Texas rangers, guns loaded, had him in the corner, he was trapped. Nowhere he could go. Here was the problem. Pepe knew no English and the rangers knew no Spanish. So there's only one person that could help them, Mr. Bartender. So Mr. Bartender is going to be the translator. So here's the ranger. So I say, Bartender, you tell Pepe that we want to know where every dollar is that he stole from us, or we're going to shoot him dead. Right? Why are y'all laughing about people getting shot? Y'all must be the woo kind of people. We're going to shoot him dead right here, right now, if you don't tell us where it's at. 
bartender said, he talked for a minute. He said in Spanish, Pepe, the Rangers are going to kill you right here, right now, if you don't tell them where the money is. Pepe said, he talked for a minute. He said, you tell the Rangers that the money is hidden in the well out behind my house. Count down 17 stones. And that's where all the money is that I have ever stolen in my entire life. The bartender sat and thought for a minute. He said, Rangers, this is what Pepe says. Pepe says he is a very brave man. And you are a bunch of stinking dogs. <laughs> Go ahead and shoot. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. You're he jumped at the chance. The bartender says, I can fix this. He don't know what I'm saying. They don't know what he's saying. I'm fixing to get rich. How many times has happened to us all? Can you say, I have a great opportunity. But it's right here. And it's right now. <clears throat> But there's so many other things I need to do. A lot of other avenues that I can pursue. Maybe it costs too much money. Maybe it doesn't cost enough. Maybe it takes too much time. Maybe it takes too little. And your mind to go around and around and around. Till finally you convince yourself not to take the chance or the opportunity. And in the moment that you walk away, it's gone. <coughs> And in the rest of your life, you look back and you say, I should have moved. I should have done it. That was the time. That was the chance. That was the place. And I missed it. See, in this life, one of the things that we struggle with is we love to be a people with a plan. And I love to have a plan. To me, that's the best day. I want to know what happened from the very moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. And that's not the way that it works when we're serving the king. One of the greatest ways to keep your joy along the ride is to realize that we must be a spirit-led people. Amen. And when the spirit moves, we have to jump at the chance. Amen. This is good. You'll like this. Romans 16. Acts 16. Sorry. <laughs> Paul's been going around. He's been planting churches. He's been sharing the gospel. Now he's going back. He wants to review with them. Let's see how they're doing. Let's hold them accountable. He has Silas traveling with him. Acts 16, verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Now, to me, a spirit of divination is a beautiful phrase. Right? It sounds wonderful. I would love to be known as the pastor of First Baptist Church of Laverne. Because Josh Walters has a spirit of divination. Doesn't it sound great? Sounds fantastic. And a spirit of divination means that you have a demon within you that you can either tell the future or maybe the past or a hidden secret about somebody's life. So it sounds great. It's bad. Slave girl, maid servant, filled with a demon that gives her the ability to fortune tell. So this is their retirement policy. They take this young girl, they set her up in the square or outside the temple. They give her the original call me now, I'm Miss Cleo, tarot card reading kind of thing. And they say, come and see our slave girl. She can tell you whatever you want to know about the future, about the past, or about your enemy secrets. And she will do it for 15 shekels. And here they come, lined up down the road. So Paul and Silas come along and this girl, she sees them. Verse 17. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way to salvation. Here's how that verse strikes me. Whenever you see somebody, don't we all have a first thought? Right? Think, okay, there's Tony. He's the knife maker guy. Right? There's Joey. He's the Friday off guy. There's Jeff. He's the guitar player guy. Wouldn't it be cool if somebody saw you? They'd say, hey, there's Bob. The man who serves the most high God. Amen. Right. Man, that's good. When your feet hit the floor in the morning, all the demons and Satan go, oh my Lord, he's awake. <laughs> We're in trouble. I want to be the one who when I'm outside and I get bit by the mosquito, he flies away singing there's power in the blood. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we want. That's what I'm talking about. Do you find it strange? 
that every time we see an evil spirit or a demon and they come in contact with Jesus or one of his servants, immediately they know who they are. Right. They say, oh, I know that guy. He serves the Lord. Don't hurt me. Step away. How good it would be to know is nothing else but a servant of the Most High God. Verse 18. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, we know about that, she turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now help me understand here. Paul and Silas walking along with some demons filled, exorcist, green-faced girl. Goes, whoo, them guys are filled with the Spirit of the Most High God. They tell people how to be saved. I say, what a pretty good thing to me. Even if it's a demon-free advertisement. <laughs> Here's the problem. The most, God, most high God of her is not the same most high God that Paul had. And Paul said, I don't want to have anything to do with a demon. So he said, no more. You shut your mouth. You see, she'd become a distraction. No matter what she was doing, falling him around, she was in the way. So he said, get out of her demon. And he immediately it left. Here's what I think we have to see about this first part right here. Remember where Paul and Silas were going. Paul and Silas were on their way to pray. They were on their way to prayer meeting. They were not on their way to find people filled with demons and kick them out. That was not their journey that day. They were not on their way to find masters who had slave girls that they were abusing for money. That was not their mission. <coughs> that was not their place. On this day, they were headed to prayer. And yet God had a divine appointment for them to meet that girl. Had this not happened, the following verses we're going to see would not have happened, which I believe changed Paul's life and his ministry. This was God's appointed time. So often what we do is we get on this journey and we're on the train track and all we do is we think about where we're going, who's driving the train, who's behind us, does everybody have their luggage, is there something on the tracks, we think about everything except for just enjoying ourselves. One of the greatest joys that you will find in this life is walking with God so closely that when He gives you a divine appointment, that you can say yes, regardless of what it is. You see, too often we just get so focused on the destination. Right? I'm leaving my house and I'm driving to church. That's where I'm going. My house to church, A to B. Quickest route possible. possible. Don't look right. Don't look left. Just get from A to B. When the truth is, the only reason that God ever had us go from A to B is because he had a little side stop over here for us on that day. But we'll never see it. And we'll never hear it unless we're listening. When I have joy, when the spirit moves, jump at the chains. Number two, you have to obtain an eternal perspective. There are things in this life that our finite brains cannot understand. For me, one of those things is the idea of eternity. Okay? I believe in eternity absolutely 100%. When I die, I'm going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But in this life, everything ends. Everything has a season. It has an expiration. So the idea of existing forever, my mind can't comprehend. Here's the greatest illustration that I've ever heard about just how long eternity is. Charles Swindoll said, Imagine a steel ball the size of the earth, 25,000 miles in circumference. Solid steel. Once every million years, a single sparrow is allowed to land on this single steel ball and to sharpen its beak and then to fly away. One million years later, that same sparrow would fly back down and sharpen its beak on that steel ball the size of the earth and fly away. One million years later, he could fly down, sharpen his feet, and fly away. He says, by the time that that sparrow has whittled that solid steel ball 
down to the size of a BB. Eternity will have just begun. Here's one of the problems that we face in this life. I'm just not finding any joy in the journey. How much are you focusing on what is temporary versus how much are you focusing on what is eternal? Verse 19. But when her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrate, they said, These men are Jews. They are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or to practice. So Paul and Silas, on their way to prayer meeting, right? They stopped off and got them a local sausage wrap or a taquito. <laughs> Having them a snack on their way to do something good. I'm spending time with the Lord today. All of a sudden, demon exorcist girl comes up and starts screaming and spitting stuff out. And he says, in the name of Jesus, you be healed. And the spirit's gone. What do you expect to happen? In my mind, I want to see crowds cheering. Man, praise the Lord, he cast out a demon. I want to see the owner say, thank you so much for casting that evil demon. I want to see the town folks say, listen, Free sausage wrap for life for you two guys. Obviously, you serve the Lord. But instead, they get mad. They get upset. They say, you've done stole our money-making business. She was what we were going to retire on. Now she can't do anything. So they drag it to the magistrates, the peacekeepers. And they say, these men are doing things that are wrong. Verse 22. And then, the crowd joined in and attacked them. The magistrates, they tore their garments off. They gave orders to beat them with rods. When they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safe. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, and he fastened their feet in stocks. Okay, so let's back up one more time. Paul and Silas headed to pray. Everybody think that's a good plan? I'm down with that. Good, good Paul and Silas. See a young girl possessed by a demon and they cast it out in the name of Jesus. Anybody see a problem with that? That's good. Good, Paul and Silas. What was the result? They were stripped down, beaten, thrown in prison, and their feet put in stocks, which means that they were spread apart as far as physically possible in order to cause excruciating pain, torture, and cramps. I don't know about you, but the way that I read that story leaves me with the feeling, no, that's not fair. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. And that's where it landed. Let us be reminded today that when Jesus lays out the plan of discipleship, this is what he says we should expect. He doesn't say this is the this is the rare thing that will happen. He doesn't say this will be the exception to the rule. Right. He says this is what's normal. Take up your cross and follow me. Be ready to suffer and to die. Why? Because when Christ came, he did everything perfect. Everything he did was right. right. And they put him on a cross and they tortured him and they killed him. So many times we become confused of what is most important in this life of whether it's the temporary or whether it's the eternal. No matter what you are walking through, be reminded today the question that you need to ask is not why. You do not need to say, Lord, why is this? <clears throat> the question that you need to ask, the really the statement that you need to make, is, Lord, I'm so glad that you're with me walking through this. Right. Because what we walk through is not near as important as who walks with us. Amen. Our weakness, His strength, His grace, always sufficient. Number three, yawning is for yesterday. When I think about yawning, I think about a person who's bored, right? I'm just so sleepy, not tired, but they're yawning because I have nothing to do, I have nowhere to go, and I'm just bored. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Let's back up again. Okay, I'm trying to get this in my mind. Paul and Silas on the way to pray. Good, I like it. 
See a girl filled with a demon. Cast it out in Jesus' name. Fantastic. Get stripped down, beaten, thrown in prison. Uh, that part, not so good, but okay, God has a plan. And now they're singing and they're praising the Lord in the midst of the prison. I don't understand that one. What they want us to know is that we are called to give thanks in all circumstances. And even these two men who did what God wanted them to do, and it landed them beaten up, bleeding, bruised, and in prison, they still said, God, you are so good to us. Amen. How easy it would have been for them to say, Lord, you know what? If this is the way it's going to be, I'm finished. This is not what I signed up for. They could have been mad. They could have been sick. They could have been scared. But instead, they were going, woo -hoo 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 -hoo! We're going to enjoy the ride because we know that God has a purpose in all things. Did you see what happened there? When they sing and when they pray right in the midst of their suffering, it says the prisoners listen. If you don't know it, church, we are surrounded by a world full of prisoners. People that are imprisoned by their sin, by their past, by their guilt, by their addiction, by their life, by their family, by their choices. And they need to be set free. Amen. You know when they'll see it? And when they'll hear it? When we are in the midst of our suffering. And we're still praising God. Amen. They will see it. And they will hear it. And they will listen. And then listen what happened. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bomb bounds were unfastened. This has been the greatest magic trick they've ever seen. Somebody could shake the whole prison and make the chains fall down. No magic tricks. They must have been drilling for oil and some kind of fracking well was over there. That shifted the ground beneath it. Wasn't that? Let me tell you what happened. Paul and Silas, in their humility and in their love and in their genuineness, cried out to God. And he heard them. That's what happened here. And he says, Paul and Silas, I hear you praising me in the midst of the storm, and I like it a lot. Watch this. Verse 27. When the jailer woke, he saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Why would he kill himself? It wasn't his fault. Well, because this day and day, whatever prisoners you were watching, if they escaped, then you would be executed by the same method they were to be executed. And these were some bad folks with some bad executions. He didn't want no part of that. I'll just kill myself. Verse 28. So Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we all are here. And the jailer called for the lights. He rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them that same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house. He set food before them. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Yeah. Can you imagine? The jailer sees all this happening. Think, this is it. My life is done. Turn on the lights. Everybody's gone. Paul says, hey, we're all right here. And the jailer comes over and says, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen the prison shake. I've never seen the shackles fall to the ground, and I've never seen prisoners who didn't run when they had the chance. So I don't know who you guys know or what you know, but I'm in. Tell me about it. Paul and Silas, how easily they could have sat there. They could have said, we're not telling you nothing. <laughs> we ain't seen anything. You done stripped our clothes off and beat us half to death. We hope you fall on your sword done it. They could have just sat back and said, you know what? I think I'll just pout for a while. They could have crossed their arms and they could have stayed silent. But they didn't. They weren't bored. 
They got to work. And it says, you want to be saved? Let me tell you about the gospel. Here it is. And in fact, let's do a little more than that. Let's go to your house and let's tell them about the gospel. And let's go down to the river and let's baptize all of you. And the moment from right then when that man's life was changed, he went from the one who was punishing these men to the one who was serving these men. Because God changed his heart. One moment he was beating them, now he's cleaning the same wounds maybe he even inflicted and setting food before him. Because he was changed. None of that ever could have happened had Paul and Silas not jumped at the chance to meet that need in that girl's life, which led them to prison, but then led souls to be saved. Now today, you can say, listen, I got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And every day is exactly the same. I change clothes, but it's the same people, the same schedule, the same routine. And I'm bored, I'm dying, and I'm joyless. Let me tell you what to do. Stop. Stop right where you're at. And ask God to interrupt your life. And say, Lord, I will be led by your spirit. And the moment that you call me to move, I will move. I will not say tomorrow. I will not say next week. I will not say that I can't because of yesterday. I will say, yes, Lord, right now, I will move for you. <laughs> Do not be hindered. Do not say, well, somebody else can do that. God has a journey for you. Yeah. And if you allow the temporary to get in the way, it will block your view of the eternal. <laughs> and if you get mad and grumpy and upset because things aren't going your way, then that will block what God is doing in your life. But you want to have joy? You want to really experience a full life? Do you want to be that crazy, weird, radical weirdo who goes through this life going, woo, 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 even when you're beaten and broken and downcast? Then you have to ask God to lead you. And then get ready to experience the great adventure of life. Yeah. Lord, today, show us. Lord, show us so clearly how we are missing out on the journey. God, convict our hearts full well for those of us who are so concerned with getting to point A to point B that our destination interferes with the journey. Lord, so many things that we could do for your kingdom. So many plans that you have laid out. So many times that we could be absolutely overwhelmed. But Lord, we're too busy. Or we're too upset. Or we're too afraid. Or Lord, maybe we're too sick. Or maybe we're just too indifferent. And we're going with the flow. Just along for the ride. Lord, this life is a great adventure. And you never promise us that our days are going to be filled with happiness. But Lord, you tell us that when we focus more on our holiness than our happiness, then we will be a people of joy. Lord, that if nothing goes right for us every moment of every day for the rest of our existence, we always have much to be thankful for. So God, we pray today would show us how to have joy for the journey so that you can be praised, seeds can be planted, and souls can be saved. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together today. This is God's invitation for you to respond to Him. And I know full well the Spirit's been here to talk to Him, and I felt Him. And I know absolutely that this message from God's divine Word was for you and for you, and for you, and for you. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, you can say, you know what, that's me. I have been sick, and I have been scared, and I have been tired, and I have been alone, 
I am beaten and I am downcast and I'm tired of having no joy and no peace. Let me give you the good news today. Jesus is the answer. No matter what it is that you seek or that you need, Jesus can meet you right where you are. Maybe it's time that you let go of the temporary. You try to get your mind and your heart wrapped around the eternal. Maybe you know the opportunity that's coming up. Maybe God has told you, this is it. This is for you. I need you to move and I need you to go. And you keep saying, Lord, but I can't right now. And you keep saying, yes, you can. If you'll just follow me. Maybe for too long, you've just been young. You've been sitting on the sideline. And God says, it's time to get to work. Because the fields are white and hard. And I have a plan for you, and for you, and for you. This is your time to respond. That means that you don't walk out the door with regret saying, I knew it. At that moment, I should have jumped at the chance to turn to Him. But I didn't. I walked out the door and I said, I'll do it later. Don't do that today. If you need to respond to where you're at, if you need to come here. Sister Gina's here. If you'd like to pray with the female. If you like me, come pray with me. If you don't like me, come pray with Pastor Randy. You can pray with anybody, but respond today. However God leads you, you move.